Well, folks, we find ourselves in the last three sections or units uh, that we're going to cover this year before STAR. All right. Um, we finished up reform. We finished up immigration before spring break. And now we're kicking off sectionalism. All right. And sectionalism is it, it's kind of a big, there's a lot going on here. We're talking about North and South and West, and we're going to talk about slavery, and we're going to talk about industrialization, and we're going to recap some things that we've already gone over. So this first little short section of notes here, uh, if you haven't heard these terms before, <clears throat> shame on you, you're not watching my lectures, or you're not listening. Uh, these are mainly recaps, this is the stuff that is, is, is that we've talked about before that's going to really kickstart this idea. Uh, that the nation is going to start dividing into north, south, west, and slave and anti-slave, industrial, agricultural, all that kind of stuff. Um, first, part one. Okay, this is the this is the very top of your notes here. Uh, urbanization. We have talked about this a half a dozen times that I can think of off the top of my head. It's the growth of cities, guys. It's it's increases in factories and mills. Uh, immigration is a huge part of urbanization, as more and more people gather in one fairly small location. Um, does it occur in the south? Eh, a little bit. It occurs in the north on a massive scale. Okay, all the immigrants tend to come through New York. Um, the port cities like Boston, New York, they're growing fast. Uh, industrial cities like Philadelphia, uh, eventually Cleveland, uh, they're going to see a skyrocketing uh, amount of immigrants and just overall population uh, occur because of the jobs that are available there. Uh, the term secede, this is one that we haven't really talked about just a whole lot yet. Um, it means to withdraw. Okay, So if you're going to secede, in, in this case, in this context, we're talking about withdrawing from the United States. Uh, individual states saying, no, we no longer want to be part of the whole, the union. Okay. Uh, we're also going to talk about emancipate, right? That's to set free, uh, to be set free from slavery. And we're going to see, we're going to introduce a newer term here, which is the new Republican Party. Okay. They're going to be formed in 1854, um, as opponents to slavery. Okay. They are vehemently against it. Uh, particularly in the territories. They do not want to see slavery spread farther than it has in the South. Uh, they want to make sure the new territories uh, in the West, Kansas, Nebraska, New Mexico, Utah, Oregon, all these new territories that haven't quite reached that magic 600,000 number, or excuse me, 60,000 number for statehood, um, they want to make sure that they remain uh, free states when they join the Union. They do not. The Republican Party does not support slavery. All right. Um, the first compromise we're going to talk to is the Missouri Compromise, and this is one we talked about before. Uh, it, it was a peaceful resolution to the issue of slavery way back in 1820. Now, remember, I've talked about it. It's a Band-Aid. It's a patch. It covers the wound. It doesn't ever fix it. It just makes people kind of forget about it for a little while. Um, what it did is it, is it maintained this balance in Congress, right? You have the free states and you have the slave states. And they each have two senators, and your population is going to adjust, which makes the House of Representatives go up and down. Uh, but those two senators per state, we've got to balance, as long as we keep a free state and a slave state, every time a new state joins the Union. All right, so Will Henry Clay, the great compromiser himself, um, pitches this compromise. He says, okay, look, Missouri, Missouri is going to enter as a slave state, okay? Uh, it's towards the south, they have an agricultural economy, uh, they're going to enter as a slave state. But, at the same time, Maine, way up in the northeast, is going to enter as a free state. Okay, so we're going to maintain the balance. One slave state for one free state. So nothing changes as far as power in Congress goes. All right? That great compromise, or that compromise that he passed, um, it smoothed over the issue. Okay, so slavery just kind of Okay, we're just going to kind of keep going with this. Um, in the Compromise, though, they also banned slavery north of the 3630 line. So if you're looking at a map, like look at the U.S. map, uh, it's basically the southern border of Missouri, okay, the new state that was admitted. 
Um, so any states that are already existing and already slave states above that line, Kentucky, now Missouri, Virginia, Maryland, uh, they maintain their status, nothing changes. Uh, the compromise was that any future states, like up in that unorganized territory, the big blue patch in the middle of that map, uh, they should be free. You cannot create a state above that line that is slave, uh, that has slave labor. Um, that's a compromise, and it's not permanent. Okay, Things are going to change again. We're going to have the nullification crisis, where South Carolina says, look, man, this this federal tariff that old Andrew Jackson threw on us is is ridiculous. Um, it's null and void. We just don't. We're just not going to mess with it, and, and we're going to secede. We're going to leave the union if you don't fix it. Well, Jackson, being the kind of guy that he was, says that's treason. I'm going to send the army down there, and they're going to enforce this tariff, and there's nothing you can do about it. Right? I will go to war over this tariff. Well, that brings up this idea of of states' rights. Um, as, as a union of states, how much power does each individual state have compared to the union of the whole, the federal government versus the state governments themselves? Um, is it even constitutional? Is, is it legal for a state to look at a law at the federal level and say, no, that will not apply uh, in my state? And this idea of states' rights is going to really kickstart the, the, the sectionalism idea uh, with some states saying, absolutely, we have that right, and some states saying, no, we ceded that to the federal government when we joined as a union. Um, you're going you're gonna to see another compromise that's going to end this crisis. Uh, so Henry Clay again comes along and says, look, the tariff is going to stay, but every year for the next 10 years, we're going to lower it and lower it and lower it, okay, until it's eventually going to be just minuscule. Um, and South Carolina looks at the situation and then kind of gauges the feeling of the other southern states. And they didn't really have a lot of support at this time for secession. Um, the other southern states were not ready uh, to just declare their, their independence from um, the Union. Okay, so they decide, they decide, okay, fine, we will accept that, we will not secede. Uh, we will abide by the lowering of tariffs, and and we'll just we'll just continue going along our way. Right. Um, along comes the Mexican War, okay, and the Mexican War is going to be an issue in that Texas is going to be annexed, and and then they're going to want to come in as a slave state, okay. Um, Mexico is going to dispute the border, we're going to go to war, right? It's about two years, about 13,000 casualties on the American side, but we really win easily. The Mexican army never had a victory on the field. Uh, American forces are going to surround Mexico City uh, and force the surrender. So in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which all of y'all should remember, we just talked about it not too long ago, um, it sets that border at the Rio Grande. So we, we get a, a solid, the Rio Grande is the border between the United States and Mexico. But it also gives us a huge section of the western, southwestern United States, all right, the Mexican session. Uh, California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, pieces of all those states and, and whole states for most of them, um, are awarded to the United States. And we pay about $15 million for it. Uh, Mexico was not happy about it, but it is what it is. Uh, they were the losers in the war, and that's what happened. The issue that is going to arise is this. The Rio Grande, or excuse me, the, the, the line, the 3630 line, most of these states are under it. So are we going to allow slavery to expand into the western territories. California is going to be immediately ready to become a state. Okay, it's not going to become a territory, or not going to be a territory for long. So, this issue is going to pop to the surface real quick again as to whether we are going to have uh, the maintaining that balance in Congress. Alright, so I'm going to introduce one more term here for you. We're going to talk about the Compromise of 1850. Okay, 
We're getting close. Uh, Lincoln's going to be president here in about 10 years. Sectionalism has really taken hold, this slavery versus anti-slavery and this north-south idea. Um, the Union, the United States, seems more like individual parts than a whole, uh, and we're really going to see the effects of that in the Compromise of 1850. So Henry Clay, yet again, still a congressman, um, uh, and Daniel Webster are going to create this compromise to yet again kind of kick the can down the road to kind of ignore fixing the issue of slavery permanently. Um, the Southerners, they are opposed to this because they are going to lose legislative power. And that is, they are vehemently against it. They cannot imagine this being a good idea. Um, the compromise here is, is California is going to enter as, as a free state. Even though they're below that 36-30 line from the Missouri Compromise, um, they enter as a free state. Um, and each state from that point on will use popular sovereignty to determine if they will be slave or free. Uh, now remember, popular sovereignty its basically our voice, and we use our voice at the ballot box. Uh, so what the compromise is, is every new territory that applies for statehood will vote in that territory uh, to determine if they're going to be a slave state or a free state. Okay, so the South, that's thats kind of the, the bone for the South, right? They, they get that. Okay, fine, we'll vote for it, no problem. We'll get slavery in the South or in the Southern territories. Cool. Um, but it also does a couple more things. So, California, free state, South doesn't like it. New territories use popular sovereignty, South likes it. They were even, one and one. Um, the slave trade is outlawed in Washington, D.C. They cannot, they cannot trade, sell slaves at all anymore in the District of Columbia. Okay, that's a knock on the South. The South doesn't like that. So to, to bring that back into balance, we have the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, think about this a minute. Just, just picture that term and really think about what you think that might mean. Fugitive Slave Act. Okay. Um, obviously the act is a law. Right? It's going to be passed the law. Slave, we know who a slave is at this point. Um, think about what fugitive means to you, and then look up that term if you don't know. So what we're going to do tomorrow, in my next lecture, uh, we'll talk about the Fugitive Slave Act, that's Fugitive Slave Act, or we're going to talk about Kansas, uh, bleeding Kansas, or Kansas, when, the, when they start fighting over slavery, whether they're going to have um, slaves in Kansas or not, uh, and kind of break down how... Um, we're, we're, the ball is rolling faster and faster toward uh, open warfare. All right. Um, hey, this is quick. We're going to break these notes into three sections because they're very long. Uh, make sure you know, you remember all the things we recapped, and make sure you understand what this compromise did um, as far as the four parts that it entailed. All right. Uh, make sure your notes complete, and I will see you tomorrow.